begin with prayer. Stir up, we beseech thee, O Lord, the wills of thy faithful people that they bringing forth plenteous works of good fruit may of thee be plenteously blessed through the merits and the might of the omnipotent Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we are with Professor George Smeaton and his work on the Holy Spirit. And we're doing a diachronic analysis with him. Well, we pick up in the New Testament section. All the evangelists refer to the Holy Spirit in connection with the birth, baptism, and temptation of our Lord. Of all the New Testament writers next to Paul, Luke most frequently reverts to it. We should be disappointed, however, if we sought in him a full explanation of the nature and properties of the Holy Spirit when his principal object was to sketch the supernatural and miraculous works of the Spirit in the first founding of Christianity. There was no denial and no dispute at that time as to the divine personality <coughs> of the Spirit. We find that the doctrine of the Spirit taught by John the Baptist, by Jesus Christ, and by the Apostles was in every respect the same as that with which the whole Old Testament church was fulfilled, familiar. We nowhere find that their Jewish hearers on any occasion took exception to it. The teaching of our Lord and his apostles on this topic never called forth a question or opposition from anywhere. Plain proof that on this subject nothing was taught by them, which came into collision with the sentiments and opinions which up to that time had been accepted and still continued to be current among the Jews. The fundamental idea connected with the Messiah is that he should be anointed. Anointed with the Spirit was still an undoubted doctrine, nor were the apostles ever compelled to meet doubts or disarm opposition in the Jewish mind. Just checking something here. The title Christ or Messiah was given to the Redeemer from the peculiar unction that the Spirit conferred on him, which was unique in nature and degree the different servants of God who were filled with the Spirit and in a far other way illustrate the mark remark by contrast. To begin with the promise which the angel Gabriel gave respecting the Baptist, he was to be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from the mother's womb, and go before the Lord Jesus in spirit and the power of Elias, Luke 1, 15 to 17. The words mean that he should be filled and immediately directed by the Spirit in the discharge of his prophetic function, and that he did not work miracles like Elijah for obvious reasons. He was supplied with gifts of wisdom and courage, holiness, zeal, and power for the purpose of proclaiming the law and gospel to a corrupt and self-righteous generation. Of Elizabeth, Zacharias, and Simeon, we read that they were filled with the Holy Ghost and gave forth their inspired announcements of divine will. But with Christ, it was wholly, wholly different. The infinite fullness of the Spirit, which was given to him, was constant and uninterrupted and the result of the hyper hypostatic union that is, was the effect of humanity being assumed into personal union by the only begotten Son. 
the Baptist going before him in the spirit and power of Elijah combined the two thoughts when he announced a person pre-existent and divine who was before him, John 1.15, and one not merely receiving the absolute fullness of the spirit, but dispensing the spirit. The Messiah, according to the Baptist, was to baptize with the spirit and with fire which places him in a different category from the Old Testament judges and prophets. That authority to give this spirit was the culminating point of Christ's exaltation. It has been alleged by Schmid that this prediction of the Baptist was a thought unknown to the Old Testament prophets and that it wholly transcended their range of view. It might have been difficult for anyone to find this truth in the language of the prophets, apart from the light reflected upon them by the New Testament statements. We may probably affirm that it was there to the satisfaction of those who could see it or should use a right, the key when it should be afterwards given to them. For the Messiah was to receive gifts for men. Psalm 6810, <clears throat> to be anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows, Psalm 45.7. The baptism with the spirit and with fire, which John contrasts with his own baptism, implies that the spirit should be dispensed by the hand of the Messiah and that he who had this power must be an accepted mediator as well as divine person. But it also intimates an abundant communication of the Spirit's extraordinary and sanctifying gifts. We come next to the sayings of Jesus on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And it's worthy of notice that on several points, and especially on the inscrutable relations of the Trinity, we find, as was to be expected, Disclosures from his lips more definite and ample than are expressed by any of his servants, whether prophets or apostles. In his last discourses spoke in the midst of the disciples, John 14 through 17. He set forth their comfort and for the church's instruction, the essential as well as economical relations in which the Holy Spirit stood to him and the mission of the Spirit for the guidance of apostles and the application of redemption in a manner more full and ample than we find in any other part of Scripture. He shows, one, that the Father should send the Holy Spirit in his name, 1426, a statement which implies that the Spirit previously forfeited and withdrawn from man in con consequence of sin should, on the ground of his merits and intercession as a mediator, the mediator, be sent by the Father for all the purposes of his redemption. He shows, number two, that the Spirit should be dispensed or given by his hand. This he repeatedly announced and much more explicitly than was ever done by the Baptist. We find that there are two principal divisions of our Lord's sayings on the subject of the Spirit, those which describe the Spirit's work in conversion, and those which describe the Spirit's work on the mind of the apostles and the church in general. Those sayings which describe the Spirit's work in conversion will be most fitly adduced afterwards in Lecture 4. Christ also promised the Holy Spirit to his believing disciples as rivers of living water. If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath saith, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he of the Holy Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the 
Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. John 7, 37 to 39. We have to notice first, Christ said, and then the apostolic commentary appended to it. While the water is, in certain passages, the element of cleansing, it is here introduced and elsewhere as the element of quenching thirst. Isaiah 55, 1. Oh, him who thirsts, let him come. They who are said in a religious sense to thirst have a painful feeling of want and desire relief in the only way in which they can attain it. Two things are included in the invitation. They are desired to come, which simply means to believe, as is evident from the alternated expression employed in the other passage, John 6, 35, implying a misery from which they escape and a fountain that is the Savior to which they are invited to repay, repair. And their desire to drink for no case can a sense of thirst be removed by merely looking at the fountain. The terms thus conjoined, come and drink, mean faith, but are no mere tautology. They are the incipient and the enlarged or continued exercise of that same grace. And it is promised that from the heart of this believing disciple, there should now well up or flow out rivers of living water, which intimate precisely the same thing as Christ said to the woman of Samaria, John 6, 14. The meaning is not that the spirit flows from one disciple to another, for none can so give the spirit, but that the spirit as a flowing river quenches the thirst and satisfies the desire so that the soul no longer thirsts for any other object. The promise is not to apostles alone, for that ulterior promise following faith in Christ is made definite. He that believeth on me. But this by no means presupposes that the believing disciple has by his own self-determining power produced this faith without the teaching of the Father, John 6, 45, the drawing of the Son of the life-giving power of the Spirit. The terms of apostolic commentary subjoined are very significant. They show that Christ meant the spirit, that all the inward satisfaction, rest, peace, joy, and assurance flowing into the soul and quenching its thirst out of the result of the spirit's operation. John says that Christ spoke of the spirit which believers should receive, explains why Jesus used the future tense and not the past rivers of living water shall flow. But the apostle adds that the spirit was not yet because Christ's glorification had not yet arrived. He does not mean that the spirit did not yet exist for all scripture attests his eternal preexistence, nor that his spirit his regenerating efficacy was still unknown for countless millions had been regenerated by his power since the first promise in Eden. But that these operations of the Spirit had been but an anticipation of the atoning death of Christ rather than a giving. The Apostle speaks comparatively, not absolutely, as is always done when the old and new economies are contrasted. Christ's testimony to the Spirit contains special reference to the Comforter, John 14, 16 through 16, 7. As further allusion will be made to these promises, it may be here suffice to enumerate 
passages and give their scope. For wise reasons, the Lord reserved his special teaching on the Holy Spirit to his last evening on earth, that the donation of the Spirit might be connected in the mind of his disciples with his vicarious sacrifice, and he might be expected as Christ's deputy. We are reminded of this antecedent and consequent when he speaks of sending the Spirit, John 15, 26, of giving the Spirit, John 7, 39, of pouring out the Spirit, Joel 2, 28, of kindling a fire on the earth, Luke 12, 49. The culminating point of Christ's exaltation was to have the authority or power of baptizing with the Holy Spirit as foretold by John the Baptist and announced by the Lord himself. Acts 1.5 The authority to give this spirit was assigned to the Son as the reward of his finished work that no one might suppose that Christ, the Spirit's dependence on the Father is removed, Christ says, whom I will send to you from the Father, John 15, 26. And to show that this was done at Christ's intercession and request, he says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, John 14, 16. That is to compensate them for their great loss in losing the visible presence of their Lord. To be convinced of the importance which Christ attached to the mission of the Spirit, <clears throat> we have only to recall the terms in which he four, four times refers to the paraclete or comforter. Whether we render the word teacher, as some do, or helper, as others do, or advocate and patron with others, or abide by the translation comforter with which we are most familiar, the tenor of the promise implies that he was to be sent at Christ's intercession and to act as Christ's deputy. A brief summary of the different operations of the Comforter may be set forth as follows. He was, after Christ's departure from the world, to take the Savior's place and in all cases of official emergency or duty to impart the necessary aid. He was to remind the apostles what Christ had taught them. He was to give them clearer and more extensive communications in reference to the doctrine of Jesus. He was to unfold to them what they could not comprehend when the Lord was with them. They were to be under his perpetual direction and superintendence and supported by him in the proclamation of the gospel wherever they should be sent, promises which imparted to them the greatest calmness and gave rise to the most joyful state of mind. Such a close union is represented as existing between the Son and the Spirit, and it almost seems from the passages which we describe, which describe the indwelling of the Spirit, as if they were identical. But that is only in appearance. For scripture represents Christ as sending the Spirit to glorify him, to supply his presence and place, to lead the disciples into all truth, and to imbue the minds of the apostles with an immediate revelation of the divine will. The Lord Jesus, in the evening of the first resurrection day, began to give the Holy Spirit to the apostles assembled in one place. And to make the occasion significant, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost.
it has often been affirmed by expositors that this was but a pledge or promise accompanied with a symbolic action and awaiting its accomplishment on the day of Pentecost. The words, however, must be accepted as they stand and in their full sense. They intimate an actual donation of the Holy Ghost, not an allusion to the gift conferred 50 days later. The atonement was already a completed fact and accepted by the Father. The everlasting righteousness was actually brought in. Every barrier in the communication of the Spirit was now removed. And the Lord did not deal in empty symbols or empty terms. He bestowed what the words imply when he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. This view enables us to dispose of two misleading views which have obtained great currency. Number one, it is held by not a few, such as Steyer, Ward Law and others, that the apostles acted with undue precipitance in filling up the vacant apostleship because the promised effusion of the Spirit had not been received. The doubts raised by Steyer against the steps taken to supply the place from which Judas fell by transgression carry more serious consequences than the propounders of this view imagine. It is of no avail to say if the Spirit came in the room of Christ, it would have been more natural for him to nominate the new apostle. The answer is that the Spirit was actually doing so through the church when it is said is not, is, is it not possible that the apostles with all their intellectual knowledge and childlike confidence might err? The answer is that the Lord in breathing upon them and imparting the spirit intimated what they remitted or retained would be ratified in heaven. And as for the comparison between Matthias and Paul Steyer refers to as alone filling the vacant place. It is sufficient to say that Paul calls himself one, born out of due time. The whole college of apostles to whom the Lord said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, cannot be supposed to have erred in their interpretation of Psalm 109, verse 8 or in the further step of publicly filling up the vacant office. Number two, another error is the notion propounded by Plymouth Brethren that believers are not to pray for the Holy Spirit because he was once given for all on the day of Pentecost and that the Christian body may not pray for what is already possessed. That rash and presumptuous position by whomsoever it is held is discredited by the fact that the apostles who had received the Holy Ghost on the first resurrection today continued with one accord in prayer and supplication for the promise of the Father, Acts 1.14. They prayed for the Spirit, though they had received the Spirit. They waited for more of the Spirit than they had in compliance with the Lord's command. This is the true attitude of the Christian in every age. And the history of the Apostles shows that not once, but on many occasions, they were made partakers of the baptism of the Spirit and fire. The effusion of the Spirit on Pentecost. The importance of the Book of Acts as a historic narrative of the public effusion of the Holy Spirit cannot be overestimated. It shows how the first disciples received the ascension gifts and went forth equipped and empowered to found 
and to expand the church. We learn that this small company, obedient to their Lord's command, stayed and tarried in Jerusalem, not forming plans how they should appear in public, but wrestling in prayer until they should be imbued and endued with power from on high. At length, all that was comprehended in Christ's farewell discourses found in the wonderful accomplishment when that great day of Pentecost came. The significance of Pentecost may be noticed from its connection with the Passover, the one referring to the redemption, the other to the new covenant as in the history of Israel. Pentecost, the 50th day from Passover and from the exodus out of Egypt was the feast of first fruits. And also, according to Jewish belief, the day when the law was proclaimed from Mount Sinai. Both fa facts have their import. Regarded as the feast of first fruits, Pentecost furnished the first fruits of the world's conversion at the outpouring of the Spirit. Regarded as the commemoration day of the Sinai Covenant, which made the Jews a kingdom of priests, it was fitting for the removal of the old economy and for the introduction of the new economy, New Testament, and to be the espousals day of the Christian church. A new revelation from God to man must needs be inaugurated with supernatural signs and wonders. As the Sinaitic covenant was set up in a miraculous way, it's obvious that when the time arrived for its abrogation, the new economy that superseded it must be ushered in by corresponding miracles. As God came down on the mount in a supernatural way, so did he bear witness to the apostles by signs and wonders, and by different miracles and different gifts of the Holy Spirit, Hebrews 2.4. Or as some will have it, the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah, with a fiery pillar, again appeared. The greatest event in all history, next to the incarnation of the atonement, was the mission of the Comforter. For it will continue while the world lasts to disseminate and to diffuse among men and women the stream of the divine life. Pentecost was the great day of the Holy Spirit, the opening from on high of the rivers of the water of life. As Goodwin says, he must have a coming in state and a solemn and very visible manner, accompanied with visible effects as Christ had done, whereof all the Jews should be witnesses. Not only so, there must be a church which, at its commencement, should give the clearest indications of its heavenly origin. That was the great birthday of the Christian church. The Christian economy was inaugurated amid supernatural manifestations which could not be questioned. When the reality came in full, the shadow passed away. The Jewish economy gave place before that which was to comprehend all nations. Now the new covenant founded on better promises, Jeremiah 31, 31, Ezekiel 36, 25. The noise as of a mighty rushing wind, reminding them of that strong wind in Ezekiel's vision that swooped down upon the dry bones and made them live. 
the flame of the fire probably reminding them of the Shekinah glory and the cloven tongues like as a fire significant of an inexplicable and miraculous power of speaking in every language and tongue constituted the solemn public consecration of Christ's ambassadors to the founding of a church which should fill the whole earth and to which all nations should flow. Thus the Pentecost was openly solemnized, signalized, visibilized, if we put it that way, as the day of the mission of the Comforter. The apostles had some experience of the nature of their calling from the mission on which Christ had sent them while he was yet with them. But now they came forth with a public testimony, not only to Christ's Messiahship and anointing, but to the great salvation purchased by his death. Holy Spirit is the promised paraclete, took the place of Christ's corporal presence. They were led by the Spirit into all truth, and the tongues were conclusive proof that the persons to whom the gifts were imparted spoke by divine inspiration. And it was not so much they as the spirit that spoke the words. The great effusion on the day of Pentecost did not mean a religious mood of mind or pious enthusiasm, but they were filled with the personal. Holy Ghost, and we'll bring this to a pause as we pray, close in prayer. A mighty God who did give such grace unto the apostle St. Andrew, that he readily obeyed the calling of thy son and followed him without delay. Grant unto us all that we be called by thy holy word and omnipotent spirit. May forthwith give up ourselves immediately to fulfill thy holy commandments through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.